and run every Wednesday in Lent at 1 p.m. in the parlor. I will be ordering the books after worship next Sunday. So if you would like me to order one for you, make sure your name is on that sign-up sheet. And that also means that Wednesday the 14th, so that's not this coming Wednesday, but a week from Wednesday, is Ash Wednesday. So Wednesday the 14th, which I'm aware is also Valentine's Day, but for us here in the church, it is Ash Wednesday, which means we will have our 7 p.m. evening service to receive ashes and take communion on Wednesday the 14th. All right, I think those were all my announcements and calendar updates for this morning. Any other news or announcements for the community? Anything that I missed? All right, then we will let the chimes bring us in to worship. God welcomes everyone. So everyone is welcome here. And so I invite everyone to rise as they're able, and we will join together in our call to worship. <clears throat> praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. For our God is gracious, and the song of praise is singing. God heals the brokenhearted and binds their wounds. The numbers and names each other's sorrows. Therefore, great is our God and abundant in power. With understanding beyond measure. With thanksgiving uh, to the Lord who lifts up the downtrodden. Let us sing so we will sing together our opening hymn. We will sing both the verses of number 413 in your hymnals.
our siblings, to care for the furthest stretches of our planet, to care for our past and our future. But sometimes we harm rather than heal, and sometimes we simply do nothing in the face of destruction. And so for these times, we pray. Oh God, how can we look at this world and not sing of your praises? We treat the world with callous indifference, using its resources carelessly. We turn our backs on people in need. The weak and downtrodden go unnoticed in our midst. We always believe that someone else will care for those in need. Forgive us. Make us fully aware of all our blessings and all our responsibilities. Lift us hands in spiritual joy in serving you, so that we may be agents of peace and hope. Amen. Amen. And as we have prayed out loud together, so we also take a moment for the prayers of our own hearts in the silence. Jesus has come to heal our spirits and our souls. New life is offered to you in Jesus Christ. Rejoice and be glad for God's love is poured out to you this day. And so we proclaim.
eternal God, just as you have always looked for ways to connect with us, so we have always looked for ways to connect with you, even when we didn't know that was what we were doing. You revealed yourself in Jesus to reach us in the fullest possible sense, and so we seek the touch of Jesus in our hearts as we read this morning, and the people say, Amen. Our first reading is from the prophet Isaiah. It is a series of questions and answer verses that serve to remind the reader of God's power as the creator, first written to refugees who were longing to return to their homeland and safety. The passage assures that those who wait on or have faith in the Lord will be given the strength to persevere. We read from chapter 40, beginning at verse 25. To whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading picks up directly where we left off in the Gospel of Mark last week. Jesus has just demonstrated his power both through his authoritative teaching and the ease with which he cast out an unclean spirit from a possessed man. He now demonstrates his ability as a powerful healer as well, and we learn how his fame spreads among the people. We read from chapter 1, beginning at verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick, possessed by demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many with who, who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout all Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Here ends the readings for today. May they be a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Fire and Suzanne, for your lovely music. So raise your hand if you ever woken up on the wrong side of the bed? It's not feeling like yourself, right? One of those days. So here's what I want you to think about as we go into our sermon this morning. When you've woken up on the wrong side of the bed and you're having one of those days and you just don't feel like yourself, what helps you to feel like yourself again? What do you do to feel like yourself again? Think about that as we go into our sermon this morning, and as we sing together our sermon hymn, we will sing verses 1 and 2 of number 432 in your bulletins. You may rise as you are able.
characters in the Gospels outside of Jesus for whom we get any real glimpse of what their personal lives were like beyond their professions. We know, for instance, that he must be married because we're told in this story that he has a mother-in-law who appears to live with him and presumably his wife, though the latter isn't mentioned. That might invite many pastors to insert right about here a joke about in-laws for all of you to groan at. But those in-law jokes are often based on the idea that at least one of the partners in a marriage doesn't much like their spouse's parents, and in doing so, they miss the fact that at least as many people cherish the family inherited through their spouse as resented. And I think it's unfair to saddle poor Simon with a mother-in-law joke when we don't know how he felt about her or for that matter to reduce her presence to a mere joke. When Mark clearly thought her important enough to include, Simon's mother-in-law is a whole person, even if she only appears briefly, and she deserves our consideration as such. More on that in a bit. Today's scripture passage follows on the heels of last week's passage where Jesus drove out an unclean spirit at, from a man, which was the first public display of power in Jesus' ministry, according to Mark. And the crowd is amazed at the authority by which Jesus heals and teaches. In today's reading from his further interactions with the eager citizens who bring him their own sick family members, it becomes obvious by now that Jesus' teaching and his power to heal are a package deal, a core part of his mission and his identity. And the People are clearly appreciative. The response to Jesus' ministry always tells us something. The good people of Capernaum may not have written any thank you notes, but they certainly would have showed their appreciation to Jesus with words as they gathered and waited to be healed. That day was clearly a good one, and the people were mesmerized by Jesus, so much so that they look for him early the next morning while he is praying. But there's more of the same work to be done, as Jesus said, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. The atmosphere at the end of this reading filled with healing is one both of a message well received and a messenger well pleased with the giving. But before all that happened with the crowd and the response, Jesus and his followers first went to Simon's house directly after leaving the synagogue. We don't know exactly why. Maybe Simon and his brother Andrew wanted their family to meet their new friend. Maybe they wanted to show him hospitality. Or maybe they knew Simon's mother-in-law was sick 
And after seeing firsthand the display of power earlier, well, maybe Simon was hoping Jesus could make her well also. Obviously, Simon himself could not heal her. And we can identify with that. So often, we in the church can feel powerless to make a difference, to introduce someone to faith, to heal a deep wound, much less to transform a life. Our role is simply to invite them to a place where we have encountered Jesus and then trust that God will do the rest. It is Jesus' role to be our true healer in every sense, then it is the church's role to bring folks close to Jesus so that they may know their spirit's healing, which is but a foretaste of Christ's reign that is always unfolding. This passage reminds us that Jesus is not afraid to enter places of sickness or to stand where demons dwell. That Jesus is not absent in sickness and death, but in the midst of it. That Jesus is with us in good times and bad times. After all, even those who experience unexpected healing are not immune to future sickness and misfortune. That fact alone tells us that there must be a deeper meaning beyond mere physical healing in this text. There seems to be woven into this first chapter of Mark's Gospel a theme about identity. Earlier at his baptism, God declared that Jesus was God's Son, the Beloved. In the synagogue, the unclean spirit declared, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And so then we have Jesus, the beloved, the <coughs> Holy One of God, healing Simon's mother-in-law, who is one of many women in scripture not identified by name. According to the story, immediately after Jesus healed her, she arose and began to serve the visitors Reading this story with our modern sensibilities, we might ask whether she really wanted to serve them, or if she did so because that was what was expected of her. And again, we'll never know for sure, but I like to think that this unnamed woman was glad to be well and just as glad that she could now be a good hostess. That she served Simon and his friends, including the one who had just healed her. Because doing so is who she was, because it made her feel like herself again. Just like some of you craft or bake or woodwork because doing so is part of yourself, part of who you are. As Jesus restored Simon's mother-in-law to health, he also restored her to her complete self, to the woman who was the consummate hostess this woman, who, this woman was brought, brought back from a place where she was too ill to be her whole self 
and being healed meant she could be that self again. I bet many of us have been in the same place, whether or not physical illness was the cause, that most of us have been in a place where we did not feel like we were living our best life. We just didn't feel like ourselves. A place where we were not able or perhaps not allowed to be who God truly created us to be. Think about all the people Jesus healed in this story alone. Some of them had been forced by their illness to live outside the community, or at least they couldn't participate in the ways they once did, or perhaps had always longed to. They could not be their truest selves until Jesus came along. The healing in these stories is not merely a physical healing, but a restoration of identity, a returning to each person's true self. That's the heart of Jesus' power as our true healer. Simon's mother-in-law was so sick that she was unable to offer hospitality to her guests. Through her healing, she was now able to return to normal, to her desired and honorable place of caring for her guests, to who she was, to her fullest self, the fact that she's not identified by name almost invites us to envision ourselves in her place. Who is God calling us to be? What does it mean for us to be healed? And then how are we meant to respond as our whole selves? Just as we receive compassion, healing, and restoration to our fullest selves, we are called to offer the same to others. This unnamed woman's full self as devoted hostess gives encouragement and strength to all of us whose ministries include acts of humble service, whether shoveling snow, preparing a meal, giving someone a ride, or simply offering your quiet presence. Every small act of love and compassion makes a difference. This unnamed woman shows us what a faithful response to Christ's love looks like. Her response is the first of many responses by women as told by Mark, including the poor widow, the woman with the costly ointment, the women at the cross, and the women at the tomb. All these stories point to the fact that all of us can make a difference even those whom society treats as of little value, whose fullest selves are dismissed as unimportant or undesirable. Simon's mother-in-law challenges us today to listen to the unassuming folks who never demand acknowledgement the folks our society dismisses. Jesus takes her by the hand and lifts her up, 
because he wants her to be her fullest self because her getting to be that self is important just as it is for each person in the crowd later that evening when Jesus lifts us up the same thing happens we are lifted into our fullest selves because it is important to God that we get to live as who we truly are. When Jesus lifts us up, just like Simon's mother-in-law, we discover that God is not asking us to be something we are not, but rather is restoring us to be our whole selves who really are. Jesus, the true healer, lifts each of us up and restores us so that we might go out to live our faith while being our truest, fullest selves. Hallelujah. Amen. Friends, as we uh, prepare to uh, pray together, a note that we have a caring card in the narthex for Dick Phillips, who's had to miss a couple of weeks due to a combination of cold and some unpleasant vertigo. So if you didn't get a chance on the way in, sign that card on your way out to let them know that we're thinking of him and we miss him and we hope he feels better soon. And are there other joys, concerns, prayer requests to share with the community this morning. Thanks. We have a <clears throat> prayer concern for our son-in-law's father who lives in Florida. He was rushed to the hospital this morning. Uh, his name, his nickname is Woody. Woody. And they don't know, he's had some serious health issues in the past and they don't know what is going on, but we just prayers for Woody. We uphold Woody and his whole family in our prayers this morning for God's light and God's healing to be with us, to be with them in a scary time. Other joys, concerns, prayer requests to share with the community this morning. Let's pray, church family. Oh, healing Savior, we know that tragedies abound. Our media all report the troubled happenings in our world. War and strife seem to be the order of the day. And we are caught up in the midst of this chaos. Calm our spirits, Lord. Help us to focus on the love you have given to us. Remind us that your healing mercies extend to us this day as surely as they did to the people of long ago. We've gathered on this day to hear your word, to join at your table, to be forgiven and healed, to find ways in which we may serve you in peace. As you always lift us up, so we have lifted up those near and dear to us, as well as those strange to and far from us who especially stand in need of your healing mercies and compassionate love, whether we have spoken their names out loud or held them in our hearts. You have heard all our prayers. You know our needs and concerns before our voices can frame them. Let us accept the love you give to us and empower us to take that love and use it for good in your world. 
Let your message of healing and restoration go forth from us again to this world struggling through tragedy and turmoil, even as it resounds within the prayer you taught us, our Father.
God is with us. We are not alone. Christ is present here. His spirit moves within us. We give thanks to God. In memory and hope. We give thanks to you, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for giving us the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice that you still call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and victory. We come in celebration of Jesus, our healer, and so with all the faithful everywhere, we sing.
nice body broken for you. Take and eat in memory of Jesus. Blessing poured out for the forgiveness of all. Take and drink, Christ's blood shed for you.
but a world in peace, be strong and of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, love and serve the Savior, and may the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer go with you and be with you all.